the major new topic of the chapter is this torque around a current loop thing. Um, in previous courses, because you qu haven't quite dealt with torque quite in that much detail, it may not have been talked about, but we're talking about it now. And understanding this will allow us to talk about very useful applications such as the motor. But let's look at this one case for now and see how we can deal with that. So we have four wires here, and we already know that for each wire, modifying the QV cross B very, very slightly, we get IL cross B for a length of wire in a magnetic field. Now this is all good and good as long as the wire is a straight line. When we have a coil like that, it's basically comprised of different segments of straight line. So let's cut this up into, say, this is segment 1, segment 2, segment 3, segment 4. And just for the ease of discussing these things, let's define a right-handed coordinate system. I cross J gives you K. And they're asking us what is the net force and the net torque. So let's do the forces first, then we can work out the torque. So the net force, of course, is the force on section 1, plus the force on section 2, plus the force on section 3, plus the force on section 4. Okay, section 1, we see that the current times L1 is going in the negative i-hat direction, cross with my magnetic field, which is always taking the magnitude of it in the positive j hat direction. Taking the cross product, i cross j gives you k. That negative sign sticks around, and you get that. F2 is equal to i l in the positive i hat direction. Cross with b, that doesn't change. So you end up with something in the positive k hat. Hey, hey look, these cancels. That's nice. In terms of F3, the IL2, let's call this L2, and this was L1 if you didn't pick that up already. Um, here we need the actual unit vector, which would be, and the angle they're giving us is 60, so we know it's going to be cosine 60 in the negative I hat direction, plus negative sine 60 in the j hat direction. And in this 2D case, it's clear that this is actually a unit vector, which is what we need. If you're less convinced, you can say that the displacement vector is L2 cosine plus minus L2 sine and divide by L2, so that's what we are left with. And then you have to cross it with my B in the j hat direction, so the j hat don't contribute anything, so we get cosine 60, we have a negative, but I cross J, so we have positive K, so then we still have negative going on there. F4, very similar, but we're going positive, cosine 60I plus positive sine 60J cross your magnetic field in the J hat, giving us I cross J positive, like that. Hey, hey, this cancels as well. So sum of forces is equal to zero. Notice I kept everything in symbols because it always works out that way. Because in the loop, whatever current you have going one way, later on you have a current going the other way, so that the effect will always cancel out. And the current must be the same because it's a loop. It's in series. Now, torque, that's something else. So we do have all the forces worked out. We need the torque now. Torque, as you remember, is defined by R cross F. R being the displacement vector from the pivot point to where the force is being applied. In this case, what we'll say is we'll put the pivot point right at the center of the loop. And the force is, is going to be applied at the center of the wires. So these are the four points where they get applied. So knowing all the forces already, we can find the torque fairly easily, so we can find the sum of the torque. So for torque 1, we have to find out this displacement from the pivot point to where the force is applied, cross with the force, R cross F. Don't do F, R, R cross F. So in this case, we know that this is L2 over 2, so that's L2 over 2 cosine 60 positive I plus L2 over 2 
sine 60 positive j crossed with il1 times b in the negative k take thing let's take that cross product i cross k gives me negative j which cancel with this negative to give us something in the positive j and then for the other one j cross k gives me positive i so that doesn't change the sign up front and that's my torque one since we've deal with f1 let's swipe it away so we have space to do torque two the displacement looks like that which is negative plus negative cross this positive number so very similar again i cross k gives me negative j so i have plus j cross k gives me positive i sorry my writing is a little messy here for torque three these are considerably easier because for number three my displacement vector is l1 over 2 in the negative i cross with that's negative negative cancel out and then i cross k gives me negative j so we still end up with a negative and then finally for number four we have a displacement vector of l1 over 2 in the i hat so that gets us negative j oops missing some b's here my apologies okay so now it's time to sum them all up let's just clean that out instead of writing out i'm just gonna circle the things i have to add up here and this thing and this thing oh hey look we have a lot of similar terms going on here we have plus l1 l2 over 2 times b cosine 60 and we have a minus same thing happens and then these two add up they're both negative so we get the sum of the torque finally is this plus this same thing so the one half and one half combines to give me the one hole in the i hat direction and that is the net torque and then we can sub in all the numbers l1 being 10 cm l2 being 8 cm so on and so forth you end up getting a number like that it's just a number but I'd like to take it just a little bit further because your textbook does so and it is quite useful to think about it in that way and that's to talk about this thing called the magnetic dipole moment because it's clear that given a certain b if that increases your torque should increase and in fact it's nice to see that torque here is directly proportional to the size of your magnetic field seems to make sense so then it's proposed that we capture everything else in this other thing called the magnetic dipole moments which is defined by mu as a vector the size of the vector as you can see here in this case is defined as i times in this case l1 times l2 times sine 60. if you look back at the diagram we have l1 like this l2 and l2 sine 60 is in fact this here l1 times l2 sine 60 is in fact the area enclosed by the loop and that sense the bigger the area the more torque you're gonna end up you can end up getting because the torque both depends on the length of the wire that is feeling the force and also the size of the moment arm so that's why it kind of works out to be the area we'll go into a little more detail of how to use this in the next example but just to just let me wrap up by saying why we call this the magnetic dipole moment because it's similar enough to the electric dipole moment if you remember from way back we define p to be q times this separation distance between a dipole with a plus q and a minus q there the amount of torque that you feel in electric field is also directly proportional to this q times a thing whereas here if you look at the wires edged on you see that the current 
goes one way on the one and then comes back out on the other. Except this time your magnetic field has to go that way in order for you to get a force like that and like that to get that to get that torque. So it's not like the electric dipole moment which goes from the negative to the positive. It's not that direction that matters, but rather is based on a direction that is perpendicular to your loop. And in order for all the direction to work out, you must follow the right hand rule. Following the current, then your thumb is going to give you the direction of the magnetic dipole moment. And we also can define this as a univector n to stick it on the end here. It seems a little artificial, but in the long run, it actually simplifies things because it let us do area of different shapes and of and also allows to to deal with different orientation quite easily. And we'll see that in the next example.